Welcome to your Lab Practical 1 exam review. And just like your lecture exam review, I'm going to break this one up into different videos. Because just like your lecture exam review, your lab exam review covers multiple chapters. And just like your lecture exam reviews, or lecture exams, your lab exam has a review that the department provides. When you come onto our Blackboard course, on the left-hand side, you'll see our drop-down menu, our course menu. If you scroll on down, you'll come to a section that says Lab Practicals, and one of the links there says Lab Practical Reviews. When you click on that link, it takes you to the page. And there's only two Lab Practical Reviews because you only have two Lab Practicals. Lab Practical is your lab exam. So in this class, you only have two lab exams. And when you click on the first exam review link, it's this thing here. This is your lab practical exam review. I'm not gonna give you a, a separate review outside of this because this one is, is pretty straightforward and complete. And I'll provide you with this video uh, to kind of help you to kind of dig through this stuff and see what they all mean. So this is the review. I'm just gonna be kind of going over your lab practical PowerPoint presentations and kind of correlating the information to what's in this lab review. Just like your lecture exam, your lab exam is gonna be pretty straightforward. Again, it's gonna be hard because it's a lot of material. It's a lot of chapters this exam covers, but the questions are gonna be straightforward. But don't feel overwhelmed. You actually know a lot about your lab exam. Obviously you've been studying for lab, but if you notice, when you look through the exam review for your lab practical, the information is a lot of the same stuff from lecture. So if you've done well on your first lecture exam and you continue to study and review, you're going to do well on the lab because the material is pretty much the same. And that's something I usually tell my students when we first meet. You hear things more than once in this class. You hear it for the first time in lecture, and then you're going to hear it again in lab. So a lot of this is going to go kind of fast because we've already talked about it. And so you can see from the lab practical review, let's start off with chapter one. That's unit one for your lab manual. It's basically like all the material in your chapter one lecture PowerPoints for lecture. So it's a lot of terminology. So just like you had to know those terms and definitions for your first lecture exam, you're going to have to know those terms and definitions for your first lab exam. It's the exact same terms, exact same definitions. <clears throat> so first here is your uh, chapter one or unit one la uh, lab PowerPoint. If in case you're wondering where did I get it from, it's just the lab PowerPoint. Remember all your lab material is down here in this online lab module section. And we're in the unit one section. <clears throat> when you come here, it's very similar to lecture. First things you're gonna see are some instructions. Then you'll see your objectives, kind of basic uh, review type material. And then when you enter the folder for that chapter, you're gonna see the, the PowerPoint and the lab videos. And I'm just using this PowerPoint to help us get through it. So no special fancy PowerPoints and no special fancy separate exam review. Lab stuff is very, very straightforward and compact. So I use those. So let's go back again to chapter one. <clears throat> again, you know a lot of this from our chapter one in lecture. For example, one of the things you're gonna have to know is anatomical position. Remember, to be in anatomical position, you need to be standing up, AKA erect means to be standing up. And you're gonna have to have your feet shoulder width apart with your arms on the side and your palms facing forward, basically everything facing forward. They could have a picture up or they could put a description and ask, is this in anatomical position? And when you're in anatomical position, we do designate a right and a left. But when we talk about right versus left, it's the specimen's right and the specimen's left. So this lady in the image over here is her right hand. And over here, closer to the words on the slide, that's her left hand. So you got to keep that in mind. When they talk about left and right, it's not your left and right. It's the specimen's left and right. Keep going. What else you got to know? You got to know your directional terms again. The exact same directional terms from lecture. You got to know them again. And for your lab exam, yes, I could ask you to use it. I could give you an example. 
<clears throat> on your exam, I could say the nose is blank to the ear. Well, the nose is medial compared to the ear because the nose is closer to the middle and the ear is closer to the side. Or I could say the ear is blank to the nose. Well, the ear is lateral compared to the nose because the ear is on the side again and the nose is in the middle. And just a reminder, remember when you're using directional terms, it's always the first place you say compared to the second place. All right, same terms, same definitions. Just got to know them again, spit it out again for laughs. Keep going. We know this stuff from lecture. Again, those regional terms come up. Why? Because this is human anatomy. We're naming the parts of the body. You got to know what we call the parts of the body. Same exact regional terms from lecture. You got to know it again for your lab exam. Not going to go through it because we went through it in our lecture review. If you want to go back and watch the lecture review videos, they won't hurt. Just make sure you're only sticking to what's in your lab, lab practical exam review. Okay, we don't go over everything lecture does. So stick to what's in this review. But keep it at the same level. Know those terms. Yes, I could ask, what do you call the lower back? Well, the lower back is your lumbar region. Or I could just say a person is having pain in their lumbar region and expect you to know I mean lower back. All right. So again, same terms. Just got to keep knowing them. Can't let go of that material just yet. What else do you need to know? You got to know body cavities. Same way, just like lecture. You got to know the major body cavities. Remember, that's the big one in the front, ventral cavity, and the big one in the back, dorsal cavity. Then you got to know what cavities are within those cavities and you got to know specific organs in the cavity. Same exact stuff you had to know for lecture. Let's go through one example, your heart. Remember your heart specifically is in the pericardial cavity. But you remember that pericardial cavity is technically a part of the mediastinum, which is technically a part of the thoracic cavity, which is technically a part of the ventral cavity. So just like with lecture, for lab, you have to look out for the word specific. Remember, if I put the word specific on a question, you got to be as specific as possible. Remember, in this class, there's a possibility for multiple right answers unless I put in be specific. All right. But again, same thing from lecture. Know your body cavities. Know what cavities are within other cavities and know a major organ in each of those cavities. Go back and listen to the lecture review material if you need that information specifically. Again, keep going. We're just sticking to our, our uh, lab practical review. So we've gone through anatomical position. We've gone through directional terms and regional terms and body cavities. Ah, but you remember when we talked about body cavities, some of them are really big, like your abdominal pelvic cavity. All this in little kind of light orange and dark orange red. That's all your abdominal pelvic cavity. You know this from our, our lecture one exam review. I mean, that's a big cavity. Remember, if you're having pain in your abdominal pelvic cavity, I can't really help. There's lots of organs in here. So you remember one thing we do with that cavity is we break it up. I'm just going to scroll down to this section where they break up the abdominal pelvic cavity. And you remember one way they could break it up is into four quadrants, just like with lecture for lab. You got to know your four major quadrants. There is the right upper quadrant, left upper quadrant, left lower quadrant, and right lower. And you got to know an organ or two in each quadrant. Uh, but again, you remember sometimes that's still too big an area. Let's say you're having right upper quadrant pain. I don't know if it's your liver that's the problem or your gallbladder. Maybe it's some intestines. So you remember we broke down the abdominal pelvic cavity one more time into nine segments. Yep, got to know that too. Know your nine segments and know an organ in each segment. It's the exact same stuff from lecture. Okay. So we got through the quadrants. What else? Again, we're just sticking to what's in your lab practical review. I promise I will not ask anything that's in your lab practical or that's not in your lab practical review. So we got through the uh, breakdown of the abdominal pelvic cavity. Ah, remember we see lots of pictures in this class and a lot of the pictures can be medical images that we get from special machines that provide what we call planes of section. 
Oh, you know what's coming. Just like lecture for lab, you got to know your four major planes of section and how they cut the body. Remember, there's the sagittal plane. And you remember in this class, things have lots of names. There's lots of names for the exact same thing. So let me give you some extra names for some of these things. Like one of the planes of section is called your coronal section, or you could call it the frontal. On your lab exam, if I ask for a plane of section that breaks you up into a front and back, you could write either coronal or frontal. When something has more than one name, you only need to give me one. I know all the names. So just name one. So as you're studying, just kind of remember whichever one sticks in your brain better. If you remember coronal, better use it. If you remember frontal, better use it. I know all the words. So whichever one sticks for you best, use that. Okay, and that, that counts for everything in this class. As you've seen by now, things have multiple names. Whichever one of those names stick best for you for your lab exam, remember that name. <clears throat> but again, let's go back to our planes of section. All you gotta know is the plane of section and how it cuts the body. So there's a sagittal plane of section. Remember that breaks you up into a right and left. Ah, uh, but you remember when it comes to sagittal, there's two subgroups. There's a mid-sagittal where they cut you right down the middle and you get equal right and left halves. And there's a parasagittal where they cut you off center. So you get unequal right and left half. Then again, we mentioned before, there's the coronal, sometimes called the frontal section. Remember, this breaks you up into a, 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 top, a front and back, sorry, a front and back. It kind of tells your name frontal because it breaks you up into a front and back. Then there's the transverse section, sometimes called an axial section or a cross section, sometimes called a horizontal section. Lots of names. Pick one that sticks in your memory. And you remember that the transverse section breaks you up into a top and bottom. And you remember there's one more section, but it's not in the picture. It's called an oblique section. Remember, an oblique section cuts you at a random angle, just like for lecture remember that definition an oblique se section oblique breaks you into a random angle okay so that's your planes of section keep going ah then we revisit organ systems again uh, as you can see it's a lot of just re repeating ourselves from lecture so now we're going on to organ systems remember you have 11 organ systems and just like for lecture, on your lab exam, you're going to have to know the organ system, know major function of the system, and major organs in the system. All right. So, for example, remember one system we saw was the integumentary system. Remember the organ is skin and major function is protection. On your exam, I'm going to be, I'm going to hopefully try to be kind of obvious and straightforward. For example, if I said, what organ system helps you to break down food for nutrients and has organs like your liver um, and gallbladder? Oh, I said liver and gallbladder. That's your digestive system. All right. So you could tell it's digestive, not muscles, because I didn't name a muscle. It's not nervous system, because I didn't name brain or spinal cord or nerves. And I told you, it's helping you to break down food for nutrients. That's your digestive system. So again, just like lecture for lab, know your organ systems. And for each organ system, know the major function and know major organs in that system. All right. So that's the organ system. And then the last thing you got to know from this chapter for your lab exam is the serous membrane. Uh, this goes back to body cavities. Remember, all your internal body cavities are lined with a serous membrane. And so on your exam, they could point to, like on these pictures here. Here's a picture of a model, and you can see the empty cavity inside. I could put a little pin in here, a little marker, and ask, where's the, where's the mouse or my pointer right now? Well, if all I said is, where's my pointer right now, there's more than one right now answer. You could say cranial cavity and or you could say dorsal cavity. But if I said, where is my pointer? Be specific. Well, it's specifically in the cranial cavity. But I could do one more thing. I could point here and say, what's lining the cavity that's 
that my pointer is in? Well, that will be the cirrus membrane. Ah, and we got to remember how to name this cirrus membrane while we're here. I'm sorry, I'm looking for the cirrus membrane slide. If your oh, video is looking kind of funny, I'm flipping through slides. Here we go. Here's your cirrus membrane. Remember, your serous membrane has two layers to it. You got to know both layers. There's an innermost layer that will touch the organs inside the cavity. And there's an outermost layer that will touch the walls to the cavity. Remember, the layer that touches the organs, that's the visceral layer. And the layer that touches the wall of the cavity, the outermost layer, is the parietal layer. Remember, they're separated by a little bit of serous fluid made by the membrane, made by these two layers. But I mentioned, we got to know how to name it. I uh, remember, yes, you could technically say, hey, class, let's go look at the visceral layer of our serous membrane for the pericardial cavity. You can say that. But a little easier way to say it is, hey, let's go look at the visceral pericardium. Remember, we named the serous membrane after the cavity it's in. And to let, it, let you know right now, we tend to ask you the things we tell you. And so far, we really only told you three basic names. We've named the serous membrane in the pericardial cavity. We've named the serous membrane in the pleural cavity. And we've named the serous membrane in the peritoneal cavity. Stick with those three. Okay. And it's all on this slide. In the pericardial cavity, it's called the uh, pericardium. In the pleural, with an L, pleural cavity, it's called the pleura, to state the L off. And in the peritoneal cavity, it's called the peritoneum. That's it. So I could, on your exam, I could use a picture, a cartoon, like this picture of the showing some lungs. And I could say, oh, I could point here. And I could ask, what is this structure lining this cavity? Well, I gave you some hints. You're seeing the picture. It's the lungs. And you got to remember your lungs are in the pleural cavity. And I told you in the question, as I'm pointing... It's lining the walls to the cavity. So the answer is your parietal pleura. This will be parietal pleura. While on the other hand, if I'm touching the, the actual lungs itself, if I came on the lungs and asked what membrane or what structure is lining the lungs, well, now it's the visceral pleura. All right, same stuff from lecture. Know the serous membrane, know what we call it in your peritoneal, per pericardial, and pleural cavities, and know those two layers. And know they don't touch. Know they're separated by serous fluid. Right, that's chapter one. Since we didn't take that long, let's go ahead and move on to chapter three. I told you a lot of times we repeat ourselves in class, but not all the time. And that's what you see in chapter three in your lab manual. It talks about the microscope. And we never talked about the microscope in lecture. We only talk about it in lab. But keeping it simple, we basically got to do two things. Same thing we do throughout this entire class. Know the anatomy and know the physiology. And when it comes to anatomy, you just got to basically know the parts to a light microscope. Okay. And so again, coming to now your chapter three's lecture PowerPoint, a very short one. There's only nine slides on this PowerPoint. And why? Because it's not that much to do. You just got to know the parts, what we call the parts to your microscope. And so if you want, I recommend you take this picture, kind of cover up the words and try to name them without looking at the words. Because remember, you're not going to have help on your lab exam. You just got to practice. Remember, you could study, study, study all you want. But how do you know you're holding on to the info? You got to practice. So I'm just going to start from the top and work our way down. I'm just naming everything that's already labeled. Nothing new here. And so we start from the top. It's where you look into the microscope. When you look in, there's little bits of glass in there. It's a little lens. We call it the ocular lens. Turns out your ocular lens is a little magnifying lens. It tends to magnify things 10 times their normal size. We call that the power. So your ocular lens has a power or magnification of 10x, meaning it makes things 10 times their normal size. And your lens are found in this overall piece where your eye actually goes. This overall black piece, which has the ocular lens inside, is called the eyepiece. Can you imagine? You got to put your eyes to the eyepiece. 
<laughs> Keep going. Ah, oh, but your microscope can make things way bigger than just 10 times their normal size. So there has to be other magnifying lenses here other than the ocular lens. It is, but they're further down. And they don't really look like lenses from the outside. They look like these little cylindrical tubes. Those are other magnifying lenses. We call them the objective lenses. You got to know your four ma uh, major objective lenses. There's the scanning powered lens, which happens to be the shortest. And it has a red band that tends to make things four times their normal size. So we say it has a power of 4x. Then there's your medium powered lens, a little bit longer. To, sorry, tends to have a little yellow band going around it. Sorry, my slide's moving. Tends to have a, a yellow band going around it. And it tends to make things about 10 times their normal size. Get a little bigger in length. You get to the high powered objective lens. It has a blue, light blue uh, ring around it. And it tends to make things 40 times their normal size. And the longest tube of all is called the oil immersion objective lens. It has a little white or grayish band around it. And it tends to make things 100 times their normal size. Yeah, they could point to a lens and ask, what is it? Like this one here, I see the little whitish gray band. This is your oil immersion lens. Or they could point to it and ask, how strong is it? Or what is the power? What is the magnification? Well, for this one, it's 100x. <clears throat> all right. And all these uh, objective lenses are being suspended. They're hanging from this little wheel you could turn. This little wheel allows you to adjust and support the objective lenses. This is what we call the nose piece. Keep going. When you look at something under the microscope, it's, you're looking at something on a slide and you need somewhere to put the slide. You put your slide on this large black top surface. We call it the stage and you will clip it in with these little mechanical kind of silverish looking clips. Well, of course we call them the stage clip. Well, guess what else? On, on towards the back of your microscope is this long, uh, skinny body-like portion of the microscope. If you were to carry the microscope, one hand would hold this back portion. This is called the arm. Mm -hmm. When you're looking at something under the microscope, you need to be able to move it around. You're able to move the microscope around with these two little dials kind of suspended here. We call them the mechanical stage adjustment knobs. They allow you to move the stage and the slide on the stage either back and forth or left and right. And when you're looking at something under the microscope, you'll also have to focus because it might be a little blurry. So you might need to adjust the focus, focus in and out. You focus with two knobs also on the side, one larger one called the coarse adjust adjustment knob and more essential, a smaller one is the fine adjustment knob. On your exam, people tend to make this mistake. They will point to a, an adjustment knob and ask you to name it and people will just say adjustment knob or focus knob. You're gonna get partial credit. You gotta tell me, is it the coarse one or the fine one? When in doubt in this class, be specific, okay? And that's especially true for your lab exam. You, you tend not to be punished for being too specific, but you definitely will be punished if you're not specific enough, depending on the question. All right. Keep going. A couple more things. Underneath the stage is this little cylindrical area. This is what we call the iris diaphragm. It's kind of like shutters on a camera, where you could close the iris diaphragm like you would close shutters on a camera, or you could open it. Why? What does that do when you close and open the iris diaphragm? It helps to adjust the amount of light that hits your specimen on the slide. Oh, how can it uh, affect the amount of light? Where's the light coming from? It actually comes from the bottom. The bottom of the microscope is called the base. And in the base, you have a lamp. And that lamp will shoot the beam up through the little hole in the iris diaphragm up to your slide slide on the stage. So if you want to adjust the amount of light, well, your iris diaphragm can help to do it. It's not the same thing as a dimmer switch. A lot of microscopes do have a dimmer, swi dimmer switch like this one. It's over here. Uh, this is different. This is just the amount of light, meaning I can make a big beam of light or a tiny pinpoint beam of light. It's how big is the beam. That's the iris diaphragm's job. 
So that's the parts of a microscope. They'll point that's you to name it. When it comes to the objective lenses, know how powerful each one is. And then one last thing they're going to do is ask you to do some math. They're going to ask you to calculate a total magnification. This is where knowing the power of each of your objective lenses comes into play. Sorry, I was looking for the objective lens. Oh, sorry. This is where the, knowing the power of each of your objective lenses will come into play. Remember your scanning powered lens, the shortest one with a little red band around it, makes things about four times their normal size. The medium powered lens, kind of longer and has a uh, yellowish band around it. That has a power of 10x, makes things 10 times their normal size. Get a little longer in t terms of the tube, and it has a little pale blue, light blue, sky blue, Tiffany blue, whatever kind of light blue you want to call it, band running around it. That is your high-powered lens, and it makes things 40 times its normal size. And then the longest tube of all will have a little whitish or grayish band around it. That is your oil immersion lens, and it makes things a hundred times the normal size. So now that you know your objective lenses, powers, and don't forget those ocular lenses in the eyepiece, remember they have a power of 10x also. You could do some math. It's a very simple, straightforward multiplication. To calculate a total mag, you just multiply the power of your ocular lens, which is 10, times the power of whichever objective lens you're using. So for example, go back to our picture. Let's say, just like in this picture here, they're currently using the scanning powered lens, the one with the little red band around it. So they could do this on your exam. I could put up a microscope like this, and I could say in this microscope's current setting, what is the total magnification? Well, it would be 10 for the ocular lens, and you could see, again, I'm reminding you, this one is set to the scanning power lens, the one with the red band. Remember, that has a power of four. So 10 times four is 40. So in this microscope's current setting, it has a total magnification of 40X. Whatever you're looking at, at this setting is going to be 40 times its normal size. So that's all the total magnification is. It's just what's the total amount you've magnified an image you're looking at. And to calculate that, just multiply your ocular lens, which is always 10, times the power of whatever objective lens you're using. That's it. That's chapter three. And again, got a little bit more time. I want to keep these videos under an hour. So to finish off this first video, I'm going to finish off with chapter four. And with chapter four, we finally begin to look at the human body just at the cellular level. Okay. So we're kind of following that structural hierarchy too. We just don't do chemistry in lab. So we start off with the cellular level, then we bump up to the tissue level. And then for the rest of the semester, we'll stay at the organ system level. So let's go on to chapter four. Again, not that much to know here. You're going to have to know the anatomy and physiology of the plasma membrane. So that entails knowing all the different parts. Again, don't worry, we'll go through this when I bring up the, the PowerPoint. Knowing all the parts to the plasma membrane and what those parts do. Okay. When they talk about a generalized cell, that's just knowing the other parts to the cell. So knowing the cytoplasm, what's in the cytoplasm, your organelles, and the nucleus. And then we finish off with the cell cycle. All right. So let's go through this. Again, just bringing up your lab manual or your lab uh, PowerPoints. Okay. And so we're in the unit four PowerPoint for the cell. And one of the first things I told you you need to know for lab, for your lab exam, is the plasma membrane. Again, same exact things as lecture. You're using the picture just like I did with your lecture exam review. Remember, when you look at the plasma membrane, first thing you see are phospholipids. Remember, they look like little balloons on a string. Remember, we say your plasma membrane has a phospholipid bilayer, meaning it has two layers of phospholipids. And remember, it's these phospholipids that are creating the seal. Remember, it's those hydrophilic heads pointing either to water outside or water inside, and the hydrophobic tails sealing themselves off. That creates the seal we call the plasma membrane. 
But again, other things here. Oh, I remember there are proteins embedded in or laying on top of the plasma membrane. Remember the proteins embedded into the plasma membrane, lots of different names, but they all for the same thing, pretty much synonyms. You could call them integral proteins, yeah, integral proteins, or you could call them protein channels or transport protein. Why? This one gives you a hint. You see it's hollow in the middle and open on either end. Things use these as little transportation vessels. They either get in and out of the cell if they're not able to get through the phospholipid bilayer. And you remember there are also proteins embedded on the surface, either the outer surface or the inner surface. It's like they've been pushed to the periphery, so we call them peripheral proteins. And you remember, some of these peripheral proteins act very similarly to glycolipids and glycoproteins. Uh-oh, what is a glycolipid and what's a glycoprotein again? Remember, a glycolipid is part glycogen, so it's a part carbohydrate, and it's part phospholipid. Whenever you have glycogen attached to a phospholipid, we call the whole thing a glycolipid. Or you could have glycogen attached to a protein. When you have glycogen attached to a protein, we call the whole thing a glycoprotein. Remember, glycoproteins and glycolipids, like peripheral proteins, could act as identifiers and receptors for the cell. And one more thing here. These little yellow globs embedded in the plasma membrane, remember that's cholesterol. Remember, cholesterol helps to stabilize or help with the integrity of the plasma membrane by absorbing excess heat during temperature changes. You knew all that from lecture. You got to know it again for lab. Okay. So that's the plasma membrane. And then we got to know some other basic, sorry, some other basic cell anatomy. Got to know those three major parts of the cell. Remember, there is the plasma membrane. But then there's everything inside. Remember, that's the cytoplasm. That's everything inside the cell. And what is that? That's some liquid. Remember, it's a gel-like liquid we call cytosol. It's things like the cytoskeleton helping to give the cell its shape and its size. And lots of organelles, each with a specific function. So know this little point here. Know what is the cytoplasm? And then you got to know that other part to the cell. Remember, it's the plasma membrane, it's the cytoplasm, and it's the nucleus. Remember, the, the nucleus stores your genetic material. Remember, it stores your DNA. And then to finish off the general cell, uh, uh, generi generalized cell, sorry, you just got to know your other organelles. Know your other organelles. Know all your organelles, basically, and their function. All right, so let's go through organelles and function. We see two of them on this slide. There's the nucleus, or that stores your DNA. Oh, remember, inside the nucleus is another organelle. You see on this picture, this little marble-like structure is the nucleolus. Remember, this makes ribosomes. Remember ribosomal RNA, sometimes called rRNA? That's your ribosome. So if I ask, what does the nucleolus do? You can say make ribosomal RNA, or you could say make rRNA, or you could say make ribosomes, because they all mean the same thing. And so that's so far two of the organelles. And if you notice, nucleus and nucleolus are spelled very similar. Don't confuse them. Okay. <clears throat> Keep going. Other organelles, keep it just as simple as on this slide. Remember in your cell, you have these little jelly bean looking organelles. Remember, those are your mitochondria. They make energy. Remember, the energy form for your cells is ATP. So you can say make energy or make ATP. Remember, the smallest organelles are little dots you see sprinkled around. It's the ribosomes. What do they do? Make proteins. That's it. Keep going. You'll see little fluid-filled sacs. Some of these fluid-filled sacs are organelles, like the peroxisome. Remember, it gives you a hint of the name. It's called a peroxisome because it's filled with hydrogen peroxide. And you remember, what do you use hydrogen peroxide for? To clean your wounds. Why? Because it could do detoxification. Okay. Oh, so I was like, where, where are you going with that, Dr. Higgs? I was getting there. Peroxisomes do detoxification. But they do other things. They could also help you to break down fatty acids and make phospholipids. You got to know that. 
Peroxisomes do detoxification, make fat, break down fatty acids, and make phospholipids. So a lot of this, hopefully, you're feeling like a refresher from unit exam one. So again, lots of lecture and lab repeating, repeat between each other. Keep going. Remember, there's a large membranous network in the cell. We break it up into two parts. There's the rough endoplasmic reticulum, and there's the smooth. Remember, the rough is called rough because it has ribosomes stuck to its surface, so it will also help with protein synthesis. But smooth ER has a whole totally different function. Just like the peroxisome, your smooth ER can also do detoxification. It could also make lipids, not just phospholipids, but all lipids. A lot of fats, not all, sorry. A lot of different fats. And it could even store calcium. We'll see this when we get to muscles. Okay. And then there's one more large membranous network here. It's called the Golgi apparatus. Depending on your textbook you're using or reading, you could call it the Golgi apparatus. Some call it the Golgi body or the Golgi complex. You could use any of those names. And it's one job is to package things before they leave the cell. Package before exocytosis. That's all. Here you go, lots of organelles inside your cells. Another fluid-filled sac is called the lysosome. And remember, your lysosome is filled with lots of strong acids, so it could break down and remove anything. It could break down and remove old cells, parts of old cells, aka organelles, or even other microbes like bacteria. Think of it as a garbage collector for the cell. Then there's the centriole. Remember, your centriole helps to assemble and disassemble microtubules. Basically, it makes microtubules. And you remember, microtubules are a part of your cytoskeleton. So your centriole is helping to make some cytoskeleton. And if you remember back to our unit exam one, remember centrioles, because they make microtubules, are also involved with the cell cycle. Remember those spindle fibers, or sometimes called mitotic spindles? Those are nothing more than microtubules. So we also say centrioles help with the cell cycle. Yeah. So that's basically it for the cell. Know those organelles. And then this last slide. We gotta know some other features of the cell, some surface features. You gotta know these projections from the cell. Same thing from lecture. What is a microvilla, singular, microvilla is plural. What is cilia and what, and what are flagella? Remember, microvilli are extensions of the plasma membrane that help to increase surface area to do things like absorption. Remember, cilia are extensions of the cytoskeleton that help to push things past the cell. And you remember, flagella are projections of the cytoskeleton that help to propel or move the entire cell. So know those three features, know those three extensions. Keep it just as simple as I talked about. And on your exam, they could use pictures or they could use models. If they use models, it will be just like this one here. This is actually a photo of one of the models we use in our actual lab. So again, you gotta practice. I recommend looking at this picture, covering up the answers off to the right-hand side and seeing if you can name all these organelles. Only the ones we mentioned. So you don't have to worry about a vacuole. You could scratch a number one. Uh, what else can you scratch out? Um... Uh... Scratch out number one. You could scratch out number seven. We didn't talk about centrosome. Um, you could scratch out 12. I'm not going to ask chromosome. All right, cytoplasm is everything inside. And you could scratch out number 14. Pinocytotic vesicle. Mm -hmm. So that's basically it for the cell. Going back to the exam review. And then the last thing we got to talk about is the cell cycle and mitosis in the cell cycle. Now remember, we did this in lecture. For the cell cycle, just like in lecture, you got to know the steps or the phases of the cell cycle in order and what phases are within other phases. Okay, remember, we talked about this. Remember, first step is interphase. And you remember, interphase is made up of three subphases in order. It's G1, S, and G2. 
And then after interphase comes the M phase where you have mitosis and that's made up of four subphases in order. It's prophase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase. And then you finish off with cytokinesis where the cell splits into two daughter cells. That's the cell cycle. Okay, so make sure you know the phases in order, what phases are within other phases, and what happens in each phase. The exact same thing as lecture. And you got to do one more thing. You got to identify phases under the microscope. And not every z single phase. You got to identify interphase overall. You, it's too hard to identify G1, S, or G2. So you only have to identify the overall interphase. Then you're going to have to identify prophase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase. You got to identify those five things interphase, prophase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase. And to help do that, again, going back to the, the oops, sorry, going back to the PowerPoint here, they try to put some of these, th these slides in this video. But before I go uh, go back over these slides, just again, hammer, hammering in those phases. First phase of the cell cycle is interphase. And in order, it's made up of G1 phase. Remember, that's kind of thing when you're born, first thing you're going to do before, before you, besides eating, pooping, and crying, you're going to grow. Same thing for your cells. And they're going to do a lot of metabolism to help them to grow. Then in S phase, remember by that time you're an adult and some adults will have kids. Well, you're going to do the same thing as a cell, but you're going to do it asexually by splitting into two cells. And when you split, you got to make sure each of those new cells has their own complete copy of DNA. So you got to make an extra copy. Remember, we do that in S phase. So we say DNA replication occurs in S phase. And then in G phase, you're going to grow some more. All right, that's all interphase. And then after interphase, you'll enter mitosis. <clears throat> and in mitosis, remember, it's made up of prophase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase. I'm going to use it, this picture here to help remind you of what's happening in each of these phases. Remember, first is prophase. Remember, in prophase, you're getting ready to move. You're getting ready to move DNA. Remember, the whole point of mitosis is to separate those two copies of DNA. So for you to do that, remember, first thing you got to do is condense the DNA up into chromosomes. Then you're going to have to make your rope. You got to make your spindle fibers, a.k.a. your mitotic spindles, a.k.a. your microtubules. That's going to happen in prophase. And then you're going to break down the nuclear envelope. Those three major things happen in prophase. Break down the nuclear envelope, package your DNA up into chromosomes, and make your spindle fibers. Then we move on to metaphase. In metaphase, remember, you got to get organized. How? You got to line up all the chromosomes. So in metaphase, all the chromosomes line up in the equator or the equatorial plate, aka the middle of the cell, and you attach your spindle fibers from opposite sides. Then you move on to anaphase. Remember, this is finally doing the work of mitosis. You're finally separating the two copies. How? Sister chromatids are going to get pulled to opposite poles of a cell. Uh, what's a sister chromatid? Well, think of it as half a chromosome. So you're splitting chromosomes in half, sending one half, a.k.a. a sister chromatid, to one end of the cell and sending the sister chromatids to the other end. And then one more thing. Remember, something begins during anaphase, but it is not a part of anaphase. Remember that cytokinesis. Remember, cytokinesis is the process of splitting the rest of the cell. This will begin during anaphase. And then to finish up is telophase. Remember, I kind of told you earlier when we did the lecture review, think of telophase as the opposite of prophase. So you remember in prophase, you packaged your DNA up into chromosomes, you made your spindle fibers, and you broke down your nuclear envelope. We'll do the opposite. So in telophase, you're going to unravel your DNA. You're going to decondense it. You're going to reform the nuclear envelope. And your spindle fibers and spindle apparatus are going to disappear. That's telophase. And cytokinesis is still occurring, but not finished yet. Remember, in telophase, you'll see something called a cleavage furrow. It's like the cell is getting pinched in the middle. That is the cleavage furrow. 
So that's the phases of mitosis. But then you're going to have to identify it under the microscope. And uh, you've seen this on our um, Blackboard website. There has been links to a website called histologyguide.org. I love this website. It's like having your own little microscope at home. Okay. You just got to know how to use it and what you're looking for. Oh, but if you're not, I'm not going to use this quite yet. I love this more for, um, for histology. To keep things simple, there's another place you could go. Uh, it's a place people go when they don't know the answers and stuff. Google. You, you could use Google, but you just got to know how to ask. If you want to look at cell cycle under the microscope, just type that in. Cell cycle, cell cycle, you could type microscope or you could type for some reason histology. Even though we know anatomy, we know histology means studying tissues, but apparently Google does not. Okay. So if you type in cell cycle histology, you'll see some slides of cells under the microscope and what it will look like to you. Like this first image here. Okay. I'm going to use this image, then we'll, I'll kind of go looking for other pictures to kind of help you out here. So when you're looking at cells under the microscope, you're just looking at a bunch of cells and it's not really any unique features to cells, but there are some unique things to look out for when you're looking for different phases. Remember, you got to identify interphase, prophase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase. And that's what we're seeing in this picture here. When you're looking at interphase, or any of these phases, you really want to focus in on the nucleus. All this dark stuff in the middle, that's the nucleus. That's where you want to always pay attention to when you're trying to figure out these cell cycle phases. And when I look at the nucleus of something in interphase, to me, it always looks like a blurry old nucleus. Nothing fancy going on. A blurry nucleus? Think interphase. Why? Because remember, in interphase, your DNA is not condensed into chromosomes yet. It's in its unraveled form. It's loose form. That's too thin for your microscope to really see. So your nucleus is going to look blurry. Ah, but when we get to prophase, remember in prophase, you package your DNA up into chromosomes. So all of a sudden, when you look into a nucleus of a cell in prophase, you're going to see dark squiggly lines, not necessarily going anywhere, not doing anything, but all of a sudden you see dark squiggly lines. That is now prophase. Okay. Then the next phase is metaphase. Just think, you could identify these if you know what's going on in these phases. Remember in metaphase, you're lining chromosomes up in the middle of the cell. So when you're looking at a cell in metaphase, you're going to see dark squiggly lines all lined up in the middle of the cell. That is metaphase. Then in, te in anaphase, remember you're going to pull sister chromatids to opposite ends of the, of the cell. You're going to rip those chromosomes in half. You're going to see that. You're going to see little dark squiggly lines looking like they're getting pulled to opposite sides of the cell. That is anaphase. And then lastly is telophase. Remember in telophase, you're going to begin to go back to normal, so to speak. You're going to unravel your DNA, get rid of your spindle fibers, reform the nuclear envelope. And remember, I told you, you're going to see something called a cleavage furrow. Depending on the type of image you're looking at, the cleavage furrow might look a little different. Here's one version here. The cleavage furrow, when you're looking at certain cells, looks like a little faint line between two small nuclei. That is the cleavage furrow. You're not looking at two cells side by side. You're looking at one cell that is undergoing cytokinesis and you see it pinching off in the middle. And you see those two new nuclei trying to reform because this is the, this is telophase. Yeah, so this first image is a great snapshot of all those different phases. Now we could practice. You could go f looking at random pictures now, like this picture here. Huh. I see this one cell right in the middle, smack dab in the middle. Boring, old, blurry nucleus. I don't see dark squiggly lines in here. This is interphase. Blurry nucleus. No lines inside. Turns out when you're looking under the microscope, most cells you're going to see are an interphase. So I see interphase here. Over to the left down here, I see interphase. Further to the left, that's another interphase. Kind of go up to the right-hand corner, that's an interphase. 
b- blurry boring old nuclei round nothing to see no oh, but look to the right over here i see chromosomes lined up pretty much in the middle of the cell this is metaphase Oh, look over to the left. I see two groups of strands that look like they're being pulled to opposite sides of the cell. This is anaphase. All right. So you could practice. You could go looking around. These are the key features. Here's another group of pictures. Oh, these are all pictures of the same exact thing. Let me give you a hint. I see groups on opposite sides. You might want to call it anaphase, but it is not. Actually, mm, you know what? I would call this anaphase. I would, I would call all of these anaphase. If you want to call it telophase, I was about to call it maybe this top middle po- picture is telophase is possibly uh, the cleavage furrow is starting to begin. You see the line a little here and a little faint line over there. You see a cleavage furrow. Here's the other version of a cleavage furrow. It looks like a little dip. So depending on the cell, it could look like a cell getting pinched in the middle. This is telophase or a line in the middle, telophase. If you do not see the line in the middle, if you do not see the cell getting pinched in the middle, you are looking at anaphase. Okay. Um, There's another way to type into Google to ask for cell cycle uh, images. Uh, I usually just type this in. Cell cycle microscope. And when you type cell cycle microscope, you get about better, truer microscope images. Like this one here. This looks like a a lot like what we see when we look at images in our lab. And again, I told you, it's just a sea of cells. Remember, focus on the nucleus. Remember, most of the cells are going to have a boring old nucleus, like this one, this one, this one. These string of cells are all cells in interphase. Okay, boring old nucleus. Oh, look at this one here. I see squiggly dark lines in the middle of the cell. Metaphase. Oh, look at that. I see those dark squiggly lines getting pulled to opposite sides of the cell. Anaphase. Oh, look at this one. I see almost a small nucleus, a small nucleus, and a faint line in the middle. This is telophase. Oh, how do I know this is telophase and not two cells in interphase? One thing you got to pay attention to are the size of the cells. Look at the average size of all the cells. Uh, most of these cells are nice and plump in size. They are not super skinny rectangles. This is not one super skinny cell. You're seeing the larger cell. This is a large cell that's undergoing cytokinesis and you see the cleavage furrow. So use cell sizes as a hint to let you know you're really looking at telophase and not two cells stuck together. All right, so we see uh, interphase or prophase will look something kind of like this one here. You see dark lines kind of becoming defined or this one over here. The dark lines are becoming defined, but not necessarily lined up, not getting pulled apart. This is prophase. This is prophase. This is prophase. Okay, so interphases, prophases, metaphase anaphase and telophase just practice just practice through through any of these pictures here i see a anaphase here in this random picture next to another anaphase so don't be afraid to look through them all right so on your exam let's bring up one more picture just to remind ourselves okay on your exam i could point to a cell like this one here I'm going to ask, and I could ask, what phase of the cell cycle is this? Well, I see chromosomes lined up in the middle. This is metaphase. Or I could point to it and ask, what phase comes after this phase? Ah, well, then first you got to identify it as metaphase and know that telophase comes next. Or I could ask, what phase comes before this? Well, it will be anaphase. So I don't necessarily have to point and ask about it. I could ask about things around it. All right. Or I could point to it and ask, what's going on during this phase? Oh, this is metaphase, so chromosomes are lining up in the middle of the cell. That's it. This class is very, I literally ask you to spit stuff right back out at me. Okay? It's just that it's a lot of stuff. Can't cram it. So that's pretty much it on chapter four. And that's the end of this first video.